This video is sponsored by War Thunder. <laughs> Last year's Worldwide Invitational featured the global premiere of StarCraft II. And I know you've been wondering if we have any big news for you at this event. Well... Today, we travel to a different time, a time where Blizzard Entertainment was synonymous not with controversy, but instead, quality. Their reputation was comparable to that of From Softwares of today. They were simply a developer who did not miss, and any game, no matter what genre it was, would rarely fail to captivate their growing fanbase and added a new shine to their spotless reputation. A reputation that was built upon the backs of three major franchises, Warcraft, Starcraft, and of course, Diablo. The era of innovation seems to be at a close. As time passes, it becomes increasingly rare to find games that are unique and special enough that they create their own genre of entertainment. And in the world of ARPGs, there are seldom few who haven't heard of the franchise that defined it. Following its release in 1996, in its wake would come an entirely new form of entertainment that continues to evolve and thrive to this very day. Its true origins can be traced back as far as 1990, where computer gaming was still in its infancy, with a game known as Angband. It was a pure and magical time, where graphics were a luxury, a time before sound effects, a time when you were, uh, an at symbol attacking the letter G. In other words, it was the Dark Ages. But, remarkably enough, the simple design would birth what we know today as the isometric ARPG. The game functioned similarly to the electronic version of playing with your alphabet soup. The player took control of a hero and traversed randomly generated levels, killed randomly generated monsters for randomly generated loot. You started at level 1 and the goal was to progress all the way to 100, which climaxes with the game's antagonist, the dastardly letter P. This is Morgoth, the final boss of the game, the dark sorcerer whose influence and evil machinations ravaged the world. And if the hero defeats them, they win. Oh, we don't have any more slave, but we are wounding. Then there he goes, Morgoth is gone. Um, so, at this point, we... As simple as it was, it was quite well known for its intense difficulty. There lay a certain addictive beauty in its simplicity, unlike a typical RPG where the story, characters, loot, and campaign are all the same for everybody who played them. Due to its randomized nature, even after millions and millions of runs across the world, not a single one was the same. The game had a certain slot machine appeal, and its longevity relied heavily upon its replayability, and those who played it would quickly become hooked on the dopamine rushing thought that the perfect drop was just around the corner. And one of these players was David Brevik. When David wasn't busy breaking hearts, he was breaking skulls. It didn't matter if it was the letter K, or C, H, A, or D. When he entered the lab, the at symbol was short for alpha male. 
The origins of his power are unknown. Some deem it to be a natural gift, and others fear it to be the work of dark forces. As David grew up in San Francisco at the foot of a mountain called Mount Diablo, he would soon enter the world of game development and began releasing titles of a variety of genres. Until one day, after once again making the letter P, his B-I-T-C-H, he came up with a new series, one that was named after the unholy mountain from which he drew his power. The idea was simple. Take the idea of Angband and bring it out of the Stone Age. Instead of an at symbol, you were a rogue or a warrior or sorcerer. And instead of ASCII code, you had actual graphics. It was Angband modernized. David would join Blizzard's subsidiary, Blizzard North, and quickly began turning his vision into a reality. And on its release in January of 1997, it would become an immediate success as players got lost in dungeons and marveled at the infinite array oh of loot. My good Lord. Their initial sales prediction sat at a modest 100,000, but it would immediately be dwarfed as it reached 1 million copies sold by November of the same year, making it one of the fastest selling computer games of the year. It would be received with critical acclaim and surpassed only by its direct sequel, Diablo 2, which was released three years later in June of 2000. Everything was improved, from classes, systems, itemization, world design, story, voice acting. It was a step up in every way, and it reached 1 million copies sold just two weeks after release, and over two decades later, either through the original or its remaster, its popularity still thrives as many today keep the torch alive. Still hoping for that perfect drop is right around the next corner. The series at this point would enter what many consider to be its golden era, and considering how much of a step up it was from its predecessor, fans could only wonder how much better the third installment would be. Time passed, bosses were killed, loot was obtained, and fans impatiently awaited news on the next installment of the game that had defined a genre. But information was surprisingly sparse, and dark tidings arose early when Brevik announced his departure from Blizzard North in 2003, leaving fans questioning after such success, what possible reason would the creator of the series take his leave, and more importantly, what would it look like without him? However, both of these questions at the time would remain unanswered. Blizzard was as busy as ever, as Warcraft 3 would see a release two years later in July of 2002, and just two years after that in 2004, the iconic world of Warcraft would hit store shelves and take the world by storm. That would be followed by two expansions, and the sequel to the beloved Starcraft series would be announced in May of 2007. So in other words, every title but Diablo seemed to be active. And at this point, a full decade had passed since the release of one of the fastest selling PC games with no real answer as to why. But little did fans know, hell came to earth after all. Development hell. Despite Blizzard's overall success, the North faced the development version of the Red Wedding. It was burning to the ground and officially being shut down in 2005. Diablo 3 had indeed been in development during this seemingly uneventful period in the franchise's history, but for unexplained reasons, perhaps losing the series' original creator, the project was put to a grinding halt, having been cancelled, then restarted, and then cancelled again. In its early years, Blizzard held quality standard above everything. If they didn't believe that their games were blockbusters, they simply didn't see the light of day, and because of this, cancellations were a frequent part of their culture, and as it turns out, Diablo was no more immune to these high standards than any other of their series. And so, the long-awaited installment to a beloved series lost its direction, its creators, and despite the eagerness of the fanbase, 
it was seemingly destined to remain in the bowels of hell. But do you know what game is actually out? Are you tired of waiting for World War III to officially kick off so we can be sent to our glorious nuclear Armageddon? Well, wait no longer. Bring war straight to your depressing bedroom with the free-to-play War Thunder. Commander Mad Season's favorite game on the Citadel. War Thunder is the most comprehensive vehicle combat game ever made. PC, PlayStation, Xbox, tanks, planes, helicopters, ships. Oh my, I played this travesty when you have over 2,500 options from 10 major nations from all the timelines to blow shit up. Or get yourself blown up with the x-ray feature which shows you to the very last detail just why you're bad at video games. Whether it be sound effects, graphics, with over 70 million players engaging in massive PvP battles, we've taken the realism of War Machines and we doubled it. Between engines, fuel tanks, weapons, each part of these machines, including the crew members who operate them, are susceptible to damage and are fully customizable, such as this historically accurate anime decal. All that's needed is you, your mouse, your keyboard, a couple of energy drinks, and an abundance of free time on a Friday night. Signing up using my link in the pinned comment or description gives you the limited time only massive bonus pack, which includes the Eagle of Valor exclusive vehicle decorator, 100,000 silver lions, and 7 days of premium, and it's available across all platforms for either new players or those who have actually gotten lives and haven't played for at least 6 months. <coughs> Anyways, for the next year, the series lay dormant until Blizzard's other subsidiary, Blizzard South, took on the job of reviving the half-finished sequel. This task would prove to be daunting, and to make matters worse, at this point, it was eight years without a sequel, and the expectations were at never-before-seen levels. Combining this with the extremely high quality standard of Blizzard games as a whole, pressure was a part of everyday life for the team. In June of 2008, eight years after the release of Diablo 2 at the Blizzard Worldwide Invitational in France, the existence of the long-awaited sequel was unveiled. The auditorium was thick with the wails of excitement and poor body odor. Fans were treated with not only a breathtaking cinematic trailer, but also gameplay previews of the first two confirmed classes, the Barbarian and the Witch Doctor. The Barbarian played much like its predecessor, focusing more on a brute force melee playstyle, while the Witch Doctor, which was new to the series, had more of a focus on control. These two wildly different playstyles were the perfect yin-yang to tease just how much variety there could be, and the developers wanted there to be a class that fit every type of player. It would quickly spread across social media and be meticulously picked over by the eight-year starved fanbase. With excitement also came criticism, however, and of all things, the first sign of dissonance between the fanbase and the developers had revealed itself in its art direction. The gameplay itself looked great, but some fans noticed that the darkness and grit that had come to define the series was replaced by brightness and color. Setting the mood is as important in game design as it is in the bedroom. You can't just charge on in and then slay and call it a day. Perhaps more so than anything else, the identity of the series for many revolved entirely around its dark atmosphere, with some even likening the action RPG to something of a survival horror game, recalling late nights hunched over at their monitors with nothing but the sounds of hacking and slashing and the luminescence of the monitor to keep them company. Darkness and brutality. That was Diablo, 
This new art style, however, some claimed was more reminiscent of their now wildly popular Warcraft series. As a response, the team would not only stand to their ground, but also double down. In direct response to the criticism, they would mock the player base by releasing comically cartoony art elements, or even t-shirts, and even the hidden vibrant stage Whimsyshire, where players slay cuddly teddy bears, ponies, and flowers. The level of sparkling happiness and rainbows await you. The player base would desperately make a petition in changing to a more atmospheric and dark art direction, reaching over 50,000 signatures, but like most online petitions, it was more of an outlet to vent, as the more bright and colorful art style would be something that they stood firm on. Visuals aside, the reveal was met with great excitement all around. An eight-year thirst was quenched, and fans and curious onlookers alike were eager to learn more about one of the most anticipated games of the decade from a developer that, at this point, simply didn't miss. Brevik's replacement was announced to be the former Relic designer, Jay Wilson, who had experience with games such as Warhammer 40,000, The Dawn of War, as well as the popular Company of Heroes franchise. Later, nearing the game's release, Wilson had shared on a blog post that he believed that Diablo was an action game at its core, and that many of the team didn't have experience with RPG design. As things evolved and development continued, more of the finer details would be discussed in interviews and blog posts and more trailers. More classes would be revealed, such as the wizard using a variety of flashy, very colorful spells to cut through their enemies. The Monk class, which was a melee support hybrid that would buff allies as they dealt damage, and the ranged Demon Hunter, who dances around their targets and decimates them from range. But the meat of the game was yet to be seen, and the question was, how did all of this tie together, and what features would return from the first two in the series? The actual gameplay looked as smooth and as satisfying as ever. The classic Blizzard polish was as clear as day, but what about the guts that made everything run? Perhaps owing to the team's experience with action and inexperience with RPG, this is where much of the trouble with the direction of Diablo 3 began. In pre-development, it was shared that the familiar skill tree system would see a return and players would get skill points as they level and put them into trees to fine tune their class according to their playstyle. As would charms, which would be focused more on core attributes to modify your character, these would be held in a special bag called a talisman, which was a quality of life feature to save inventory space. The skills themselves were tied to rune stones that were found in the world, which were similar to rune words in Diablo 2 in a few ways. They would empower and alter skills in different ways, and came in seven ranks, with higher ranks being available in higher difficulty settings. Traits were announced, which were a series of passive skills which you spent points on to obtain, Similar to the perk system in the Fallout series in the sense that they heavily altered how your class played and adding a new layer of customization. Artisans would make their debut. You had the blacksmith who will craft armor and weapons for the player, a jeweler who will upgrade gems, and also the mystic who can change a single affix on an item which would give the player more control over the loot that they obtain. It would operate on a story-driven campaign spread across four acts with four difficulty settings, Normal, Nightmare, Hell, and Inferno, with each difficulty unlocking the next tier, offering greater rewards, but also greater challenge. PvE wasn't the only focus though, as a PvP arena system was also being developed, with players being able to compete against one another for rewards with even playable demos being given to players in the following BlizzCons. This PvP system in general would get a lot of attention in these conventions. At first glance, it seemed almost too good to be true. Every avenue of the game was getting major updates and what they called improvements. PvE, PvP, quality of life, and even the economy when the Real Money Auction House was unveiled in June of 2011 where players would be able to buy and sell items or gold using real money, with Blizzard taking a cut for each sale. This would be received with mixed feedback. While some were excited at the prospect of earning money for playing a video game, others were skeptical that the most efficient way to play wouldn't be through time investment, 
but instead money investment, turning the already $60 title into an expensive pay to win game. What would receive even more controversy, however, was the announcement that Diablo 3 would be an online only game. Some people, I've heard some people say like, well, you know, why online for a single player game? And my first response to that is, uh, we've never seen Diablo as a single player game. It's always been developed from the ground up as a co-op game. Um, so for us, we see Diablo as an online game. We think that's the best experience we can give uh, to players. And that's what we're focused on, is what's the best possible experience we can give. You know? The positives, as the team would explain, would be that cheating would be easier to detect and prevent, and multiplayer could be easily integrated. The bad, however, would be that this would of course require an active internet connection to play, even for solo players, and connection issues either from the player or from Blizzard servers would interrupt gameplay, an especially concerning thing for those who are going to play hardcore mode, which had permanent character death. Nonetheless, the release date was approaching, and interview after interview would be given, explaining the finer details of the systems, and as a result, excitement snowballed to levels never seen before. So how long have you been coming for? Uh, like 70 hours. 70 hours? Yeah, he's been camping 60, so he's hardcore as well. After 12 years, one of the most highly anticipated games of all time was about to be released, and once again, it was from a developer who simply didn't miss. Blizzard, surprisingly, in an uncharacteristic moment at that point, missed. The concerns with the game being online only came back to haunt them. An astonishing 3.5 million copies were sold within the first 24 hours of release, and climbing to over 6.3 in its first week, quickly making it one of the fastest selling PC games of all time, and smashed even their highest estimates. In their other online only title, World of Warcraft, a login queue was built into the game for situations such as this, but believing that Diablo 3 wouldn't be nearly as popular, it didn't have it. So as players rushed into play, their servers strained under the load, and they were greeted with the now infamous Error 37 code. The issues persisted for weeks, disappointed players asked for refunds, and when they were refused in Korea, the government raided their offices. Internet cafe owners formed a class action lawsuit over the game's poor performance, and has since been referenced many times in many games, including Blizzard's MMO, World of Warcraft. Players who did get in found massive lag and frequent disconnects awaiting them, even for solo play. Oh fuck. I'm gonna fucking die. I am going to fucking die. <laughs> no, 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 no. Dad. As well as a plethora of abandoned systems. The team's lack of experience with RPG games showed, as many RPG-related features such as charms, the talisman, skill tree, runes, runestones, and traits were all either completely redesigned or removed entirely. Instead, the amount of active skills were reduced and were assigned to a selection of augments that were learned automatically when leveling. Attribute points were predetermined based on class, there were no swappable weapon sets, Everything was heavily simplified. The only way that you could customize your character would be through skill and rune choice, with players even being unable to use more than one from the same school, unless they enabled the elective mode, which was hidden in the game's options. The items themselves, as many would describe, were boring. Legendaries were in the game, but they were extremely rare, and they were also usually poorly itemized. The best items in the game, usually, were rare items, which had no special gameplay altering affixes, but instead just core stats which simply increased damage or survivability, and with the scrapping of the mystic, which allowed the reroll of a single trade on an item, the bulk of the customization was placed squarely on the shoulders of the skill and rune systems. When it wasn't lagging horrendously, the game had a smooth action-packed experience with a level of polish that many had come to expect from the developer, but where it had action, it lacked RPG. It also struggled in its gameplay loop, which was as follows. The players would clear through the campaign in the first three difficulties, 
normal, nightmare, and hell. But when they reached Inferno, its struggles with balance started to become clear. Ranged classes would have a far easier time than melee, as even with the best gear from hell, didn't offer enough survivability to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the tough elite packs. What I pressed, I did smokescreen! The game can't fucking handle it! Look at this shit! And so, a conundrum was created. You needed gear from the difficulty you can't clear to clear it. Oh, what the fuck! The penalties for dying weren't severe at first, only damaging gear, which you could repair at town for an amount of gold. While this wouldn't be an issue for the game's hell difficulty, as death wasn't a large issue, when players reached Inferno, many were losing gold from repairs faster than they could obtain it from the world, resulting in them essentially bricking their character and creating another conundrum. You need gold to repair your items, but you need your items to farm gold, leaving only two options make a new character from scratch, or run to the real money auction house and purchase gold. And so, for many, especially melee classes, the fear of the potential for pay to win quickly became realized. Not only did you buy the best items from the auction house, you even bought the ability to continue to play in the auction house, leaving an extremely sour taste. It would also introduce difficulties in balance and design. The game was live service, and patches would be pushed out to address its issues with balance, and one of the areas ripe for attention were, of course, items, and this would be fine in normal circumstances, but with real money now being traded, each change had the potential to devalue once good items that people were now paying real money for. The most extreme example of this would be the attack speed nerf. One of the most effective ways of gearing for every class was to stack attack speed on every single item, because Blizzard thought that this would oversimplify an already simple itemization system. They patched an update that would half the attack speed stat on all items, even retroactively. So, in a single moment, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of items were made to be irrelevant. I happen to have experience with this, but on the good end, this sword I sold for the maximum amount allowed, which was $250, and the very next day, the nerf came in, making it vendor trash. And so, the only option left for many was the dreaded pot meta. In a few areas of the game, players could speed past enemies and break destructibles, which would have some gold that they could scrape together to repair their full set of broken gear, and sometimes, rarely, an item. As more and more players started to brick their characters in this challenging difficulty, they would resort to this endgame loop. For many, especially for melee classes, it would even be the most effective way of progressing their character, because pots of course don't fight back. Behold the brutal non-stop action of Diablo 3! Venture into the bowels of hell and slay nightmare-inducing demonic overlords. Danger awaits you at every turn, but dare you face it? Also, this would later be nerfed by Blizzard, forcing even more people to the real money auction house. Though this final difficulty mode seemed to be completely broken and untested, it was done in-house with Blizzard employees and what would soon become an infamous quote, the game's director, Jay Wilson, took their testers' suggestions on what the difficulty would be and boasted that they had doubled it. Internally, we had, we had this super hardcore test team. We got a lot of hardcore players at Blizzard um, that tested Inferno, and we got it to the point where they thought it was challenging enough, and then we doubled it. This quote would quickly become the source of ridicule and mockery by the game's unamused fan base. Some would resort to cheating, one of the reasons that the game would be online only would be to have more effective measures against hacking and duping, and while it would prove to be effective in some ways, it's hard to cheat if you can't log in to play. Ultimately, it would prove to be fruitless, as duped items would quickly flood the real money auction house, undermining one of the design choices that led to one of the worst launches in video game history. Where the PvE was lacking, 
the PvP was non-existent. The competitive arena mode, despite being a big focus of attention in previous conventions, was scrapped entirely, despite their endless resources and, at that point, their spotless reputation. The game was hardly playable, and when it was, the experience itself came short on nearly every level. Server issues persisted and were addressed in patches, and also by the once massive player base shrinking a whopping 70% within the first couple of months. The community and social media as a whole watched as the spectacle unfolded and waited eagerly for what the developer's response would be. In August of 2012, a few months after the release of Diablo 3, David Brevik was interviewed by Inc. Gamers, and he was asked his thoughts on the release, sharing mixed emotions. In a Facebook post that was thought to be private, a number of Blizzard employees commented on the interview. Obviously irritated by his response, they handled the criticism in the same way they did for all of Diablo 3's development, with mockery, and with the new director himself stating, Fuck that loser. The Diablo 3 team at this point had a reputation of responding to criticism with dismissal or mockery, and while many would give the benefit of the doubt and attribute it as playful, this clearly wasn't. The fan base erupted, fighting back with equal vitriol and harassment. Here we had a team that inherited a beloved franchise. They fumbled it in almost every regard with an objectively terrible launch, making incendiary comments to its founder. One of the people who is responsible for them being able to work on the series' third installment, ensuring rather tame criticism, all things considered. Wilson publicly apologized for his comment and expressing regret for his choice of words. He would step down as the game director in January of 2013, moving on to other projects within the company, with Josh Mascara replacing him, who had led the console adaptation to the game. And so, with a new leader at the helm, Diablo 3 would change wildly from this point forward. Classes were balanced, difficulty was overall reduced, the auction house was later redesigned and then removed entirely, and the loot, perhaps most of all, was reconfigured with legendaries being buffed both in stats and in drop rate. It would see the Reaper of Souls expansion two years later in March of 2014. Two new classes were added, one of them being a DLC, and PvP finally saw a release with Brawl Mode, which saw no effort of balance and resulting little activity, and its endgame shifted towards the Greater Rift system and leaderboards, and seasonal relaunches with new items and balance changes to add some variety for returning players. Overall, these changes were largely seen as an improvement, and the game today is completely unrecognizable from its former self, as it's transformed from a slower paced but still action oriented game with bugs and flaws abound to a dopamine infused treadmill. It retains a niche but dedicated community of players today, but its legacy for many is defined by technical issues, design flaws, instability, and controversy. In an effort of adding some constructiveness, and keep in mind that today we do have the benefit of hindsight, the lessons to be learned are many. The game from its birth was marred with struggles and lack of direction, being started and restarted multiple times over, and even losing a lot of its original creators and even its visionary. From the very start, despite its rabid success, 
the developers who inherited the project seemed to look at the series as flawed and they took it upon themselves to fix it with no insight from the community or even those who had created it. The customer is not always right, but being able to understand what makes something popular and being able to put ego aside and draw useful and fun design from all forms of feedback, constructive or otherwise, is a skill in all creative works, game design especially. As stated, the relationship between developers and the player base was something that would define Blizzard in its early years. There's a certain closeness with the community that no other developer had and is evidenced with the fact that BlizzCon would be one of the first gaming conventions dedicated solely to the developer's own games. It would be something that they valued highly. They became well known for being very in tune with their communities and consequently their games felt like games made by gamers for gamers and their quality would speak for themselves. However, success, if left unchecked, leads to arrogance. From their success, this sort of untouchable rock star celebrity culture was born, and so humility slowly transformed into arrogance, and discourse between developers and fans transformed into confrontation at best, and abrasive at worst. And Diablo 3 would mark one of the earliest moments of this transition, considering that the project was inherited and the team admittedly had little experience with RPG games, Insight should have been a valued and welcomed resource from its large, passionate community. But where coordination was needed, mockery and friction was delivered. Even from the series' founder himself, vitriol was the response, and what resulted was a release that was seemingly disjointed and lacking direction from the very start. An action RPG with little to no RPG, and as many abandoned, restarted, reabandoned, or redesigned features as there were issues and flaws. The story of Diablo 3 is one of hubris, and allowing confidence to devolve into egotism, and it teaches the valuable lesson of the consequences of the developers telling the players what they like and what they don't like. An issue that pervade in more than just their Diablo series at the time. You think you do, but you don't. And an issue that continues with its newest iteration, Diablo 4, and the release of its predatory mobile installment. Hey, uh, just was wondering, is this uh, an out-of-season April Fool's joke? <laughs> do you guys not have phones? Yeah, you guys that, all have phones, phone, right? Ironically enough, the series' most critically successful release recently is... Diablo 2 Resurrected, a game that was essentially created over two decades ago. But sadly, perhaps a statement on the state of affairs within the industry has shown critical reception seems to have an inverse relationship to profitability, as the community is continuously disregarded and promises are failing to be fulfilled. Morale for the series' future seems to be at an all-time low, a disposition that started in 2012 with the dumpster fire that is known as Diablo 3. And we got it to the point where they thought it was challenging enough, and then we doubled it. Thank you once again to the sponsor of this video, War Thunder. Play free today on PC, PlayStation, or Xbox using my link in the pinned comment or description, especially if you're a new player or one returning from six months for the massive bonus pack with premium vehicles and more available for a limited time. And let me know what you think of the video. I will be doing more like this, so any feedback will be greatly appreciated. Wait, actually, you know what? Everything I do is perfect. And fuck you, losers.
Farewell for now, mortals. We hope you enjoyed today's video. See you again soon.